Maniac Rob here from Board Game Maniac to bring you another gameplay video. In this game, you're, we're going to play, as you can see right here, Mantic Games, The Walking Dead, All at War. Now, this game has been out for a while already, and there's oodles and oodles of uh, expansions and upgrades for this game already. I got this game a couple of years ago, and I never got a chance to learn to play it or anything else. But I did, however, finish painting the miniatures recently for it. I love the look of the miniatures. I love The Walking Dead. Just in case anybody did not know, though, that this game, The Walking Dead Out War, is not based off the famous TV series that's on the AMC channel, as well as other online and so forth, too, as well. This is based off of the comic book, The Walking Dead. So you're not going to see some characters that are into the TV series in games or expansions that you're going to buy. There is going to be some possibly in the future, but as it stands right now that I know of, it, when this video goes out, I could be completely wrong that there could be other things out for it, that it's going to be just off of the comic books, as I said. Now, I've never played this game before. I watched a couple of videos a long time ago to try and learn to play the game because I wanted to do this for a while onto the channel but I just never got around to it for some reason or another. I even built this board. You can't really see much of it right now, but we'll go down close with the camera so you can see what it looks like. I built this board like two years ago, I guess, but again, I had all intentions of doing a battle report for this uh, game, and I just didn't do it. Unfortunately, I feel bad for it, but I'm doing it today. And I'm going to learn this. So what we're going to do is we're going to play the first scenario into the uh, Getting Started book. And I'm going to referring to the rules into the booklet a lot. I'll probably make some rules mistakes. And if I do, by all means, as other viewers have done in the past, comment down below in the little comment section and say, hey, you made this rules mistake. You should have done this when you did, but you did this instead. That is wrong refer to the page number in the rule book to let me know exactly where it is because that's how I learn the games more and more from you the viewers out there to tell me hey this should be done and that should be done which is great I love that when I see comments down below saying help me learn the game and everything else and just comment down below and let me know what you think of the game if you played The Walking Dead All Out War uh, let me know what scenario was your favorite or if it made any custom scenarios because I'd love to know what the custom scenarios are so I could play them in the future on this channel. This is going to be a solo mission. I'm going to be using two characters, but you can play. Uh, it's originally a two-player game and it's played on a different size board. This one here, for the scenario in the book, you only play a 10 inch by 10 inch board for the first one, but this is bigger than 10 inch by 10 inch. And I'm just gonna go from there. We're gonna see what happens. Hopefully, just hopefully, I'm gonna survive and I'm gonna be able to kill the walkers or get the objectives, but we'll go over this scenario and everything when I go down close onto the board. So hold on to your hats, pull out your katana like Michonne, you know, Rick with his, uh, his gun, his 45 caliber, you know, whoever, and let's get ready to shoot some zombies and kill them and survive this apocalypse that is going on. This guy didn't survive too well. He was a little loud. He kind of came at me too much. So I pulled my katana out and phew, off went his head. That's why he's not saying much right now. He's just here, he's quiet because he's a trophy for me right now. That's right, he's a trophy. Let's play The Walking Dead War by Mantic Games. Here's a look at the tutorial part one that we're playing. Now, this is in the book, read this first. It's a quick start rules guide. Tells you all the components, and also too as well, it shows the length of the board. Again, originally this tutorial, it's called Tutorial Part 1, Learning to Survive. 10 inch by 10 inch. And you can see here, these are three objective markers that are placed onto the board equally apart. And then you have W, A, W, B, and W, C, which is Walker A, Walker B, and Walker C. So you start this tutorial with three walkers on the board, and there's an S and a P. These are your characters or heroes. Now this is Sandra, and this is Patrick. We will definitely go over their stats, and I'll show you the character cards and the miniatures shortly. But, uh, just to talk about what this thing is, is that, uh, I'll read this quick little insert. It says, the sun is setting, and Derek has sent Sandra and Patrick on a last-ditch supply run before it gets dark. 
they come across a cache of food in an abandoned warehouse, but it's surrounded by walkers. So this is what happened. That is exactly, pretty much, Derek just sent Sandra and Patrick out, we have to get supplies. So we have to pick up the three supply tokens right here, and that ends the game. This game can be played solo or cooperatively, with one player taking Sandra and the other taking Patrick. For the setup for this, you need to set up the game board as follows, 10 inch by 10 inch, but we are expanding it. The board that we're playing on that I created, I think is two and a half by two and a half feet. Uh, gather the components in the diagram above. Place the supply counter, survivor models and walker models into the playing area in the position shown, which is right here, which I did. We'll get to the, the game board shortly. Shuffle the event and supply card deck and place them face down at the side of the gaming area. Only use the cards in the deck with the symbol. Now this symbol, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but it's a zombie head. So I already went through and I separated the cards into this for the introductory tutorial game, Learning to Survive. You can see the symbol a little better there under bandages. Put the walker reference card, threat tracker, range, ruler, kill zone, template, and dice within easy reach. Turn the dial to the threat tracker position four. And that's this thing right here. We're gonna have to set the threat track to position four. Once you're ready to begin, it can be useful to have the back cover of the rule book in front of you too, for a handy reminder of the rules. And there's the rule book right here. Great, great artwork into this. Like, look at the miniature setup into this. I didn't do an unboxing video of this. I kind of wish I did, but again, I had this a while ago. I just never did anything, but it's chock full of rules so that you can find everything out and so on. So the back of this here book, the rule book, like I said, this is turn sequence. So it gives you all the turn sequence and it kind of gives you a quick reference sheet of how you can get all of the information to this. So I don't know for exactly if there's new rule set or updated rules for this. I did check online and what I did find, you can see here, this says Walking Dead All at War Player Aid. Classes, actions, panic, Keywords and all has definitions and everything. I got this off of uh, the website boardgamegeek.com. So you can go there. They have many, many other games that people have posted onto there. So if you're thinking about buying a game and you want to know what's involved into it, you can always go to boardgamegeek, boardgamegeek.com and you can check them out too as well. That's where I got these. So that is the table. That we went over the table set up. Now, the playing the game. There's an action phase, event phase, melee phase, and end phase. I'm not gonna go and read all of this. When I come across it, I'll probably pause the, pause the video, read it, and then come back and just sum it up more or less. So what I'm gonna do now is I got the board already set up. I'm going to switch over to the board so we can take a look at that and we'll go from there. Before I look at the board setup, I'm gonna show you, I have everything laid out, what we need for this, also a little bit more. So this is the tutorial, uh, learning to survive. You don't need the equipment deck. This comes later on, but I just laid it out there to show you. This is the supply deck and the event deck. Now these are going to come into play as we play the game. This is your threat tracker. So it, tell, it told us in the book that we have to move the threat track to four, which is right here. You can see here that it has like all quiet, low threat, medium threat, high threat, and then the last thing is death, which is number 18. If we hit number 18, we're dead. That's it, we lose the game. You can see here too as well, is these are little, the, the cardboard tokens, the search tokens. I have them on the board. I purchased the scenery pack, which is 3D scenery, and I got that, so I'm not using these, but these will be laid onto the character cards. Uh, if we get to pick one of these up. I'll explain it as we go along. Kill zone, I'll talk about that while we play it. Different types of dice. Some dice are stronger than others, and the reason why it does that because you can see there's different there's different uh, markings onto it. Some dice have fewer markings, some dice have more mar markings. But just to go over the markings on the dice, this obviously means a hit. This is two hits and an exclamation mark, which means exclamation mark is a headshot. And that's how you can kill walkers, I think, is only, or other uh, battling characters. 
with the head shot. And then you have obviously blank sides. This is the same, but there's more choices on the white than what they are the red. And the same with the blue, there are more choices on the blue, or more options on the blue than the red. So the red, I think, is your basic, and then it just goes up from there into other ones you can do. We also have two different types of dice right here, and I looked in the book. This is to do certain tests for like if your gun is out of ammo, or you know, like if you're going to do a climb action and so forth. And this yellow dice is a panic dice, and it has different symbols onto it. And what I'm gathering from the book, what it tells me, is that whenever the threat track goes up to a certain degree and the characters are all, all have a nerve rating, if the threat track is above the nerve rating of what the characters are, you have to roll a panic dice before you start your turn to see if you actually panic or what happens to you. And that's if the threat track goes up more than what your nerve rating is. And events, there's one of the phases, the event phase, where it's going, you're going to draw, it's going to tell you what certain walkers do if you have to add more walkers to the board and so on. And that's for that. Equipment obviously means straightforward, you can pick up equipment. Supplies, who's why you pick up supplies. But in this game, the tutorial, it don't say anything about using the equipment deck. It's only the supply deck and the event deck. And that's what that is for the board. I mean, the setup for all the tokens, dice, and everything you need. And also I have my handy dandy dice box for rolling, which is really cool. And I like my logo, that's not doing, you know, product placement. Uh -huh. Let's take a look at the character cards and the miniatures now. So the two characters for the first part of the tutorial is Sandra and Patrick. Now, this is, I'll just get a little close shot of Sandra's miniature. You can see her there, she's carrying a knife, but I don't think you start actually with the knife itself. It just, that's what the miniature is holding to make it more of an action pose. And that's the back shot of it. Pretty cool. Just finished painting these. Now there, I have a, a few expansions for this and so that I know which character's which is I actually just stuck a little sticky thing on the bottom of it and I wrote their name. So it's easier to find out what characters for what. And that's Sandra. Looking at Sandra's character card. Sandra, she's a scavenger and a runner. So uh, scavenger, I guess, is what group she is, and the runner is what specifically she is, so she's probably going to be fast. You also see a picture of her. There's 20 points. So in the game of The Walking Dead, when you're playing against somebody else, or if you're play even, playing even a solo mission, you have a point value that you can have as, up to as much miniatures and equipment, and then you can't go starting off. You can't go past that point value, which I'm understanding. If I'm wrong with that, please comment down below and let me know. Also, too, as well with this, you see melee, shoot, and defense. So for Sanders melee, it's one red dice. For shoot, it's one red dice. For defense, it's one white dice. This is her nerve rating. She's a medium nerve rating. So again, with the threat track, once it goes up a past the medium, she's going to have to do a panic test before she starts her turn. Here is how many wounds she can take. It's four, and then she dies. If she gets a headshot roll by a zombie, then what happens is this is going to get turned over to a bite mark. And that will, if that happens during the game, uh, you're going to have to do a test roll, I think with the black dice, if I'm not mistaken. And with that test roll, at, at the end, if you don't roll a shield or a badge, then you're going to take one additional wound on top of and that's only if you have the bite mark. Now, every character has special traits too as well. So special for Sandra is nimble. At the start of the melee, including Sandra, she may roll a black die on the shield. She moves out of base contact and at least one inch away from all current enemies by the shortest route possible moving through models if necessary. That is her special ability. Now, on top of that, you can see here, you see pack, item, body, head, and item. So, and there's different shadows onto this. So items, she can hold two items. She can hold something on her body and she can hold something on her head. And for her backpack, she can hold only three items. That will come into play during the game. Also, too, as well, I didn't mention, this token means it's first player token. So whoever's going to be first player, they have this on them so we know exactly what it is. The last token that I want to show everybody for Sandra is this little red X. It is double-sided. It's the same. So after you activate Sandra, do all the moves, you're going to place this onto them so you know 
that your character is activated. Some games, depending on point value, you can be playing with more than one character. So this is helping you let you know, okay, I already activated her, so there's no confusion whatsoever. Let's go on to Patrick and look at his card. Wah. Here's a look at Patrick's miniature. He's holding a bat. You know, nicely detailed miniatures. I really like the look of these miniatures. Um, I think they're 28 to 30 mil scale, if I'm not mistaken. That's what they look like. I could be wrong. And also, too, as well as I label Patrick on the bottom so that I will not forget that this is Patrick. Let's look at his card. So for Patrick, he's a scavenger as well, but he's not a runner. He's a bruiser. So he would be a lot better in defense. As Sandra is a little fat, she's a runner, so she has different ratings as Patrick is. So Patrick for melee is a white, as opposed to Sandra is a red. Shooting is red, shooting is red for both. Patrick's defense, however, because he's a bruiser, is two red dice, as Sandra only has one white dice. His nerve level is medium, as well as Sandra's. It's exactly the same. He has four wounds he can take, as well as with Sandra. And he don't have any special abilities. He just has a little uh, text insert here. We're willing to take our chances. Going back on the road isn't an option. We're making a stand here. And that's what it is. So again, no special abilities for Patrick. Sorry, Patrick, for that. His pack only holds two, as Sandra holds three. Two items, a body and head. So everything else is the same. That is the characters for this tutorial mission for The Walking Dead. Let's look at the board and how I got it set up according to what the graph was in the book. Here's the board setup. Now, again, I created this eh, a year ago, a year and a half, maybe two years ago. I can't recall. But, you know, it has a, a wood. It's raised up a little bit, so I don't have to bend down so much when I'm playing. It's got a concrete. It's like a little urban street scene. Where did I get this? In the core box that you get for The Walking Dead, you actually get a, a paper mat that you can use to play. And all I did is I took this, the paper mat, and I laid it over and I drew it out. But I increased the size because I wanted to have a bigger playing area. So if I play any other games, I can use this so it'll be multi-purpose. You can see there's a building I have set up here. This is not into it. The only thing it tells you for setting it up here is the distance where to place everything and so forth were 10 inches. But again, we're playing with the larger, so the game's gonna take a little bit longer, maybe, unless I die horribly quickly and very gruesomely. We'll see. But that's the setup. I kind of mimicked it. And also, like I said, I got the uh, 3D scenery for the game with Walking Dead All at War. You can see a nice truck. Two trucks I have. I have two cars. I got some uh, concrete barricades. Got some garbage bags. Now, these garbage bags, I made these that they didn't come into any kind of expansions or anything. All it is is I just took actual garbage bags, cut them up, put them in a shrinking machine. I want to with my time machine, but I used my shrinking machine and I shrunk them down. No, just joking. Just, I cut up some garbage bags, stuffed them with paper and tied them with thread so they looked a little bit like garbage bags. You can see there's one objective, two objectives, Three objectives, just like it shows into the map for the scenario I have played. These are fences. Now these fences don't come with the 3D scenery. I actually picked these up from a company called Six Squared Studios. Look them up on Facebook. They have a web page too as well. Great company to make NDF stuff. So definitely look them up because it's really worthwhile. They can add so much more dimension to your gameplay. Along with, the, again, the 3D sceneries pack that you can buy from Mantic Games too as well. Um, let's see where else, I have some barricades here too as well. These barricades were in the 3D scenery set. You can see them just painted them up here. Also some more barricades too as well. Barricades. I got a building, though this is not from the 3D scenery too as well. I'm not exactly sure where this building is from, possibly TT Combat. I could be wrong, sorry guys. I don't know exactly where that is. But that is the board set up. You can see I'm ready for battle. Now I placed my zombies. I got one zombie here. This here is Zombie Shane. He's kind of, you know, I didn't paint all my zombies, just a hero zombies. So in my story, uh, this is after, you know, like potentially Shane got bitten and killed by a zombie. So 
he turned to a, a walker. And you can see here's another zombie. This is uh, zombie Rick. So I painted him up gray because he's a hero zombie. I want the hero zombies to be different than the other zombies. The other zombies are, you know, like they're painted with color. This is like a gray scale, black and white scale. So I can e easily determine, you know, like this is a hero zombie or so forth. And what I do, t what I can tell from the videos and also the rule book and everything, if a hero is playing and he gets bitten and killed, not headshot, but killed by zombies, it comes back as a prone zombie. So just say this is normal Rick. He gets killed by a zombie. So we, or Shane, I should say, take Shane off the board and put a zombie Shane here and he's prone, which means he's laying down. And then during the game, he will stand up. So I just wanted to paint them so they're a little bit different and distinguishable as opposed to, you know, other zombies I can tell here. What? What'd you say? We're gonna play the game short. I gotta explain it first. Stop, just keep quiet. Even when I cut your head off, you know, you're still just yambling on and on and on. Don't do it anymore. Shh, stop it, stop it. All right, back to the game. So you can see there's another zombie here. This here is a zombie that is just painted up like skin cone and everything. These zombies, like, all of my zombies, except for my hero zombies, and my heroes were painted from my son. 14 years old, I think he's doing a great job doing the painting. He wants to play board games. He loves board games just like I do, so we will be playing a lot of games together. He's featured on the channel. So if you want to see Brady playing some games with other board game maniacs, you can find them online onto our YouTube channel, BoardGameManiac.com, and there you go. That is the game set up for it. Now, one thing I'd like to mention, if you want to purchase this game, or any other game, they are sold into local gaming stores around your area. If not, you can always go to the website, manticgames.com, and they have a lot more different games as opposed, not even just like uh, The Walking Dead Out War, they have like Hellboy and other games that are really, they look really cool. I'm looking forward, I may possibly be trying to pick up the game Hellboy, because I love the movies Hellboy, and I love the comic book series Hellboy, because I want to try to play that game. If it's going to play anything out like this, I'm sure it's going to be great. I'm excited to play this game. Like I said, I never played it before. I just watched videos onto it. I, you know, got it all set up at one point before. It's like, hey, I'm going to try to learn to play the rules, and I just, something happened. I don't know what it was, and I couldn't do it. So now this is it. We are ready to try to kill some zombies. And remember, the objective of this scenario, the beginning scenario, learning to survive, is just to survive and pick up the three tokens right here, which are your, you know, like supplies that you can find to take back to the colony so that everybody will live another day. Hopefully, though, that Sandra and Patrick will live on too as well. Uh, one thing I did not do, this is a really long clip, but it's all right. I gotta put Sandra here, and where's Patrick? There he is. Patrick starts here. Now I'm playing a cooperative game for this, so they're gonna be working together. They're not gonna be like trying to stop each other. And that is it. That is the game setup. That is the components that's used into the game, and so on, and so on, and so on. I just didn't mention about the ruler. I'm gonna just cut the video clip here. I'll be back and I'll explain what the ruler is. For the ruler, it is a 10 inch ruler and it is double sided. The width of this is actually one inch. Actually, where do I swing it down this way? So you can see it says one inch and it says sneak and run. So this is the hero side of the ruler. So the heroes can do different actions. I will go over the action while we're playing. So there's a sneak that don't generate noise and then there's the run. Sneak is up to four inches, run is up to eight inches. Eight inches run will develop noise, create noise I should say, so zombies will move closer to you. Sneak it, don't make any noise. On top of that, at the zombie side, you see two ones are shambles. So zombies will shamble up to six inches and any noise or mayhem that is created, it's a full 10 inches. So that is really gonna be scary if you know there's noise or mayhem created. So shamble and noise. Hero side, zombie side. That's right. So let's go on to start playing this game. I am so excited. What? Listen, keep going. 
keep shooting your mouth off, and I will make you only a piece of an ear or an oath. That's it. There will be nothing left to you, so just keep it quiet while I play this game. Stop interrupting this gameplay. I'm not going to say it anymore. As I said before, there's four phases the game goes through. Action phase, event phase, melee phase, and end phase. We are on the action phase right now. And it tells me, players activate their survivor models, moving them around the table. However, the walkers may react. So we're going to start doing the action phase first, and then we'll move on to the event phase. Now with the action phase, just a quick thing. This is all in the book, so it's very easy to follow. Hopefully I'm not going to make that many rules mistakes or any at all. We will see. But if I do, please again, comment down below. Refer to the page number into the book and tell me I should have done this instead. I did that instead, which makes around. So for the move, a sink is up to four inches. You don't make any noise. A run is up to eight inches and it creates noise. So let's go to the board. I'm going to move each of the two characters and then we'll go on from there. So one thing to note before I do that is during the action phase, each character has two actions they can perform. There's many different actions that they can perform. And on top of that, they can't do the same action twice during the action phase. On the Player's Aid sheet from uh, BoardGameGeek.com, you can see the actions are listed here. So there's a move action, shoot action, search action, hide, stand up, hold your nerve, swap item, make noise, repair, smash, and start a fire. Ooh, so you can start fires in this game? This is great. So let's look at the move action first. So sneak four inches, run eight inches is noise. Shoot action, create mayhem. Search, must be in base contact but cannot search if a survivor or hub is also in contact with enemy. So when I'm getting to the search tokens which are here, if there's zombies within range, uh, I can't pick it up or do the search. That's gonna be horrible, that's gonna suck. When I say suck, I mean suck for me, not suck. The game's gonna suck, just gonna suck for me if there's zombies or walkers in the way. Moving on, hide. Prone if in contact with barrier. So if you're in a barrier, I guess you can hide as one of your actions so they can't see you or other enemy models can't shoot you. Stand up is another action. Hold your nerve, reduce threat. Roll black die. Shield reduces threat by one. Oh, so you could hold your nerve for one of your actions. So if we're into the threat tracker, we're up above, or we're getting close to the danger level of dying, we can, as one of our actions, hold our nerve, roll the black dice. If we get a shield, it's reduced by one. Swap item. Swap between pack and inventory slots or other survivors in kill zone. We'll potentially go over that one more. Make noise. So you can want to draw walkers or away from other uh, survivors on your team, you can create noise and they'll start coming towards you. Repair, roll black die, shield one success. What? That's interesting. Smash, noise, shooting a window breaks it automatically. Noise and mayhem, and that you're going to use the ruler that we showed. Start a fire when holding a weapon with the flammable keyword. So some weapons into the supply deck or equipment deck will have flamble as a keyword so that you'll be able to do that sort of stuff. Um, so that is the actions that you can do and you can see there's other different ones. There's your classes which each character is. So tactician, bruiser, marksman, runner, and support. And it gives special things that it can do if there's anything or noted on the card and what have you. So let's go to the board. Let's start this game off. And I'm gonna let Sandra go first. She's gonna be player one and she gets two actions for this first phase. And I just went over the action. Let's go to the board and see what Sandra's gonna do. Sandra is going first. So what Sandra's going to, again, the objective is to pick up them three supply tokens and then the game is over. Sandra is going to do a, a move action and she's going to sneak, because if she runs, then what's going to happen is that it can create noise and then any zombie within the closest zombie, I should say, within 10 inches, gets to sh make a shamble six inches closer to that that uh, miniature or survivor. So Sandra, measuring base to base, is going four inches, you can see right there. So Sandra is going to sneak up to this base. And she's stopping there, because that's her sneak action is four inches. So she didn't create any noise, so because of that, no walkers are going to be engaged and try to come out. 
The only thing with this, now, I just looked in the book briefly, and if there's any barricade, you can do a couple of things with barricades. One is you can defend the barricade, and one is you can try to do which is called a climb action to get over it. Sandra, on the other hand, she is a runner, so any climb actions done by runners is an automatic success, so she don't have to do climb actions. Just say she wasn't a runner, though. I'm going to explain that briefly. Just say Sandra is not a run action. She decided on her next turn to go over the barricade. Now, as long as when you measure, just say that she was potentially right here and she wanted to sneak again. As long as you measure the four inches and her base will rest over the barricade and not on top of it, then she can successfully try to do a climb action if she's not a runner. Runners automatically pass any climb actions. So just say she was there, you're gonna take the black die and you're gonna roll it. Now, because I rolled a shield, she successfully climbed it so then she would be able to do her move just like that. If she got this, she has failed. She failed the climb action so she wouldn't be able to do it. Again, I could be making rules mistakes. I'm going by what the book says and what I interpret what the book is. I could be wrong. If I am, please, by all means, let me know that, hey, you did this wrong. But we're gonna keep her up. She just walked, or sneaked, I should say, up to there. So she don't have to do any kind of test whatsoever. That was one action she can do. She can do another action if she wanted to. Such as like uh, search, but there's nothing here to search. She can try to hold her nerve and so on. So for a second action, I may do a hold her nerve. The threat track right now is on four, which is a low threat. Now, Sandra, for her second action, she's gonna to try to hold her nerve. And what that means is that she gets to roll the black dice. If she rolls a shield, it's success, and we're gonna reduce the noise counter or noise tracker by one. So let's see, she got it. So this goes down by one, and that's all Sandra can do. She only has two actions per action phase, and you can't do the same one twice. So she couldn't do a, a sneak twice and, or a run because of that, she chose to hold her nerve and it dropped it by one. Good job, Sandra. Let's go on to Patrick. Patrick, on the other hand, he's a scavenger bruiser. Now, what bruiser means is that any bulky items, it's only gonna take up one item slot instead of two. So if somebody picks up a bulky item that is not a bruiser, then what happens is it's going to take up more slots. I'm gonna double check that in the book, but I think that's exactly what it means. And again, I'm just referring to the uh, player's aid chart from boardgamegeek.com. A bruiser, bulky items only take up one hand slot. So on the character cards, you have two item slots, a left hand and a right hand, obviously. I'm just gonna swing it over here and show. So left, right, and a body, and a head. So bulky items, you would need two hands to carry them because they're heavy. But if you're a bruiser, it only takes up one item slot. So that's what the bruiser means. Let's go on to Patrick's turn now, because I think what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to try to run. Yeah. Patrick is going to run. Now, he's not as patient as what Sander is. Even though Sander's the runner, but Patrick is going to run, and when you run, as we all know, according to the book and this range ruler, it is going to create some noise. Now Patrick is decided he's going to go this way, and Sander is going to try to make it that way so they can try to get into the compound and get the three, the three tokens, the search tokens, the supplies. So when you do a run action, Patrick moves up his run, which is eight inches. He starts here, and you can see it's all nicely labeled, and he would stop right at the eight inch mark, which is the run. Now, when Patrick makes a run of eight inches, you're going to have to measure 10 inches, and whatever zombie is within the 10 inch range, the closest zombie, not whatever zombie, but the closest zombie within the 10 inch range of the survivor that runs can do which is called a shamble, and a shamble is six inches. So let's take the 10 inch ruler. Now let's see, obviously he's in 10 inches. You can see there's no other zombies that is in 10 inches. 
So we're gonna do a shamble here for this zombie. Let's try to get it on camera. So the shamble, I'm gonna place this marker down and I'm gonna move him four inches or six inches, I should say, for a shamble. He's gonna make it closer to Patrick. I'll be back when I do that. It's kind of hard to do the moving and everything while holding the camera with one hand. So I'll be back when I do that. For Patrick made the noise from running, then the zombie shambles six inches. If the closest zombie would shamble six inches, like I said, that is within 10 inch range of Patrick. And it's gotta be the closest zombie, or the closest walker in this case. So you can see he shambled. Now one thing I wanna mention about the walkers, when they move, they have to move in straight lines. They can't like climb barricades or, or what have you. They can only move in straight lines, not like the survivors that can climb and so on. So that is Patrick's first move. Now I think for Patrick too as well, is he going to try to do, uh, hold, your, hold his nerve? I know we're only down to three for all quiet, but let's just try it anyhow to see if Patrick can hold his nerve to drop the threat track down one more notch. Come on Patrick, hold your nerve. And he does it, he gets a two. So now the threat track is gone down another one. So all's quiet. We're doing really good for this so far. And that ends the action phase for the two heroes for this tutorial. Now we're on to the event phase. In the event phase, all manner of dangerous things can happen as walkers shamble around the table. The phase has two parts, check kill zones and draw an event card. So for checking kill zones, this is your kill zone template you can see here. So the way you do this is you're gonna take the kill zone template, you're going to place this over any walker and see if they have to be kind of dead center in the circle where my finger's kind of jumping around. And any survivor's base that is within this kill zone means that the walker is going to go directly base to base combat with the survivor. So it pretty much, it just runs up to the survivor to try to kill him. That's the first step of this. After you do the, uh, the kill zone, you're gonna do what is called a draw an event card. And when you draw an event card, you have to go by what the threat level is and some really bad things could happen. But let's check the kill zones and we'll move on from there. Kill zone number one for Shane. You can obviously see there's no uh, heroes, survivors around. You can see the other zombie right here. There's no hero survivors right there either. Now, we're onto the Mohawk zombie. Patrick may potentially be in the kill zone for the Mohawk zombie. We will see. I'm going to take the kill zone and I place it directly over top. And you can see the center is there. And you can see the base is just not, it's maybe like a quarter of an inch away from the kill zone. So Patrick is safe right now. So that zombie will not shamble base to base contact to get into mayhem or melee, I should say with Patrick, so that's not bad. So that is how you do checking the kill zones for the event phase. Now the next thing we do for the event phase, we're going to draw an event card. Here's the event card, and just to take note to as well, is just like it, it said in the book for the first tutorial, you only wanna pull the event cards that have the zombie face onto them. So this is the first one, let's flip it over. You can see the zombie face is right there. Let's see if I can get it in focus for you, there you go. And this is, Pandemonium, plus one threat level. So therefore, before I do anything, I'm gonna to have to take the threat level and rise it to that. But it's still an all quiet, it's not a low threat. Then we look at what the all quiet is. All quiet, each player rolls a white dice and moves that many eligible walkers in the direction of their choice. If it was low threat, it would be something different, medium threat, and then high threat would be different. So now we have to take one white dice and we have to roll it and that's each player has to do that. So we take the one of the white die and we roll it. And that's how many walkers on the board we will move in any direction. And we will move them a shamble, which is six inches. So let's see how many. One. So Sandra, who has the initiative, because she is the first player, gets to move one zombie in any direction that she wants and it's in a six inch shamble, and then Patrick will roll and do the same. I'm not gonna do all of this on camera. For the whole first turn, for the four phases, I'm going to, and then after that, I'm gonna cut it, I'm gonna play the game a little bit, and then when something significant happens, I'll be back, but right now we're going through every part for the first turn. So, now, 
Just to touch upon too as well, the initiative of where Sandra, I decided Sandra's going to be the first player. When you play a scenario, it should tell you at the beginning of which player is going to have initiative. After that, it alternates. So Sandra would go first for the first first turn and then Patrick's gonna go and then it's just gonna keep alternating back and forth. Unless maybe a card could be drawn and tell different. But right now, we're on the event phase. Threat level went up to three, it was at Two. Originally when it started it was at four, but we hold our nerve and dropped it down, which is really good. We drew the event card. Now, Sandra gets to move one walker in a shambling motion up her direction and any one walker. What I'm deciding to do, or what Sandra is deciding to do, is she's going to move this walker six inches this way. Now, the thing is, is uh, what happens when the walkers move is if they hit any barricade, they stop. They, they can't climb it or what have you. They can only move in straight lines on their movement. So Sandra wants to lock them out right there. If I'm doing this wrong, please comment down below and let me know what the timestamp and the page number into the rule book. So Shamble is six inches, but he's shambling straight. And on the three inch mark, he hits the barricade. So he stops and that is it for that walker. Continuing on with the event phase, it is Patrick's turn to see how many walkers he gets to move. He also gets to move one walker up to six inches shambling. <sighs> that's, that's not bad though because Patrick is probably going to try to get the one walker away from him. You can see here that Patrick is kind of close to what a walker is. Now the walkers ain't going to move anymore for this turn because I checked the kill zone for the event phase. We also have Zombie Rick right here which is covering um, one of the, the search tokens, but I'm going to leave Zombie Rick where he is right now because I am gonna might have to try to fight him when I get up closer. But right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this Mohawk Zombie six inch shamble away from Patrick to kind of give him a little bit more clear line of sight for moving. What I did there is I just moved the walker back to six inches so it's on the table edge again. And that is where he's staying to give uh, give Patrick a little bit, whoops, a bit, give Patrick a little bit more clear area to start making his way up to the tokens, the search tokens. On top of that too as well is if he decides to move him this way, now you can see that Sandra's on the barricade here, so I don't want to pile them here. This may be a quick game, could be a long game, but we'll see what kind of carnage we get into. I may try to deliberately set up a couple of things just to show everybody that's watching this video for the the combat and everything else for the melee we will see we, we will see but in any case right now this is where we're at and this ends the event phase now we are on to the next phase and we'll just keep going on to there the next phase will be melee phase but as you can see from the board nobody's in melee so because of that, we're going to skip this one, and it's melee is all hand-to-hand -hand fighting is resolved. If any survivor is in melee with another zombie, before you even start the melee turn, you take the threat track and you're going to have to move it up one. That's right, you would have to move it up one before anything, because melee is creating noise, which will attract more zombies, and we don't want to do that. So we're not doing anything for melee phase for the first turn. The end phase now, dead walkers can rise again and you check to see if you're done enough to win. So a little side note for this tutorial part one, learning to survive. We will now play through turn one, going through the phases one by one. Each phase will finish with an example. For your first game, simply follow this step by step. Now, I am following it step by step, but I'm not exactly moving it the way that it told me to move. because. In here, what I notice, it tells you like move, move Patrick here, move Sandra here, and so on and so on. But I didn't do that. I'm kind of playing a little bit off of it, but I'm still sticking to the tutorial on how to, this is played. So the end phase, I'm kind of just rambling on and on. So for the end phase, what this happens is if any uh, prone walker is there, you're gonna have to roll if you roll the shield. The, the walker will be able to stand up and to you check your objectives to see if you succeeded in any of them or if you won the game. 
The objective for this tutorial mission is to pick up the three search tokens that you can see here and we're not even close to picking up the three search tokens. So because of that, we are done of the first turn and we're going into the second turn. Now, like I said before, I'm not gonna record every step-by-step -step to make the video longer than what it has to be, but I'm gonna just start playing it now and when something significant happens, I will be coming back to you and explain to you what happened or showing you periodically on a recap of where the heroes are at in the game. So hold on to your hats. You can have a little, you know, go get a cup of tea or a pop or a water, what have you, some popcorn. Get something to eat and, you know, watch what goes on here. Wish me luck, everybody. What? No. Keep quiet. I already warned you. I don't even understand, zombie. I just know you. Keep it down, buddy. Keep it down or you're next. That's right. You'll be next. During the survivor phase, Sandra, she was here and she actually made a run instead of uh, a sneak. And that attracted this walker that was running the barricade. So he moved because he can't. He was already up against the barricade. So he moved and he's within that right there. Now, on top of that, Patrick, too, as well, he was over here and he ran. So because he ran, it's going to create more noise, too, as well. So now, what you do in the case of a run, like I said, you're going to have to measure to see who is the closest walk within the 10 inches, and they do a shamble to you. So let's measure this. So you're looking at uh, zombie Rick is 7 inches. And the Mohawk zombie is nine inches. And this is eight inches. So zombie Rick moves. The way zombie Rick's move is he's going to shamble. He's going to shamble the six inches up. And that is the six inches that shamble up. He's not base to base. But you know when we're going to do the event phase, what's going to happen is that they're going to be double melee in both it looks like. That is all the actions for the heroes. I did do off camera a uh, hold your nerve test and both of them had failed. They rolled a blank onto the shield black dice so because of that the uh, threat track does not go down any. Now we are going on to the event phase and the first thing we do in the event phase is we have to check for the kill zone. So let's do zombie shame first. And you can see Sandra is close to it, so Zombie Shane runs up to get in melee combat. This walker, there's nobody here. We do Patrick, and Zombie Rick is definitely in the kill zone area, so he's going to run up and be base to base. So that ends the first part of the uh, event phase where, again, you measure the kill zone. Next thing is we're going to draw an event card and see what will happen. It may be something really bad. We will see though. We will see. Drawing an event card. It is hunger. So first off, automatically, threat goes up by one. So we're back at the original position, the starting for the threat counter, which is four. Now, it is in, you can see it's in the low. It's not all quiet, so we have to read the low threat. Each player moves one eligible walker towards the nearest survivor. Oh boy. So, because of that, they're locked in combat. You can't move any of those. Locked in combat, but this one is not. So the only thing this eligible walker can do is do a shamble six inches closer to Patrick because from Sandra to there, it's too far. And that would be it. But for an eligible walker, it has to be within 10 inches. And you can see there, let me flip this over. That is 10 inch range. So that old walker, that walker will shamble up to six inches towards Patrick. You can see, sir, there's some things starting to happen onto our second turn. So Sandra's locked in base to base combat with Zombie Shane or Walker Shane. And Patrick is also locked in combat with Walker Rick. And the Mohawk zombie is hot on his trails. So that pretty much ends the end of the melee, not melee phase, the event phase. 
Now, judging from this again, there's nothing else that happens because we are in low threat, but that's what happens, and that kind of took a little uh, toll on the group for sure. What we have to do now is we're going on to the melee phase. And during the melee phase, what happens here is that for any, if there's any uh, models or survivors in base-to-base -base contact or in melee with the walker, the threat level goes up. Now, you see the two of them are up. That doesn't mean the threat level is going up two. It's only going up one. So it don't matter how many people is in melee at the beginning of the melee phase. It just will go up one. So we go to the threat counter. And the threat counter now is going to go to five. Ooh, we're getting there, we're getting there. But that brings us to the melee phase, which I wanted to hopefully get into so that we can see how melee works. Before we go over how melee works, I want to show you the walker card. So for melee, it's one red die. For defense, it's one red die for the walker. But there's something that's a catch here with the walkers. Outnumbering a single walker in a combat role in melee value as normal, one red die. A second walker in the same combat role is two red die, a third walker, three, and so on, up to a maximum of five red die. So if there's a lot of walkers that are in combat with a survivor, what happens is that you're getting more red dice that the, uh, the walkers can attack the survivors with. And that, that can be like detrimental for sure for the survivors. Because Patrick has the initiative for this turn, because Sandra started it off and it alternates. So Patrick, with the initiative, is going to go first for, for attacking or defending against Zombie Rick. Now, how you do that is I'm going to look at Patrick's card. So let's swing over here. You can see melee. Is, what, is a white dice, shooting is red, defense is two. You know, Patrick can have a choice, so not just Patrick, but any survivor that is locked in melee combat with another, uh, with a walker, or even with another survivor from a different team, they either choose to either attack or defend. So in this case, because it's only one walker, Patrick is going to choose to attack. So he's going to have one white dice, as you can see there for his melee, it's white dice, they don't have any weapons on him. And the walker is going to defend, so he has one red dice. And then we roll them together and we see what happens. So this is for Patrick. So both of them has a hit, you can see there. And in a case of a tie, what happens is that the tie always goes to the survivor. And what happens when that is is that the the person who loses is pushed back one inch just like so but because uh, Patrick didn't have any more hits onto the zombie they cancel each other so the zombie don't go prone and because of that, it, that that's not what happens so let's move on to Sandra to see what happens for her is she gonna defend or is she gonna fight into the rule book it does talk a little bit more about the pushback so with the pushback, the losing model, like, like I did, is pushed back one inch. If something is blocking that losing model from getting pushed back one inch, then the winning miniature will be pushed back to one inch. And that's just to touch upon for the pushback when you're resolving the melee. On to Sandra's melee. Sandra has a melee of a red die in defense of white, but she's going to choose to attack. Why not make it even? So red against red, because the walker has one red die too as well. Now, I did something wrong here, and that is because they're two the same colors, I should roll one at a time so I can determine. But in this case, they're exactly the same, and I said Sandra was attacking anyhow. So because of that, this walker, walker Shane, gets pushed back one inch. And that's how it happens, because just like the other roll, with Patrick, it canceled it out, and the it always goes to Survivor if there's a tie. I'm lost for words here. So that ends the melee phase, and we are on now to the next phase. Just like before for the uh, end phase, there's no walkers that are prone. 
or nobody, none of the survivors are prone. So because of that, nothing happens. We didn't reach our objective, so we go on to the movement phase for the next turn for survivors. I'll be back when something big happens or don't happen. Just a quick note, if I was playing with somebody else and we were like using more than one miniature, or two miniatures I should say, every time we activate, like I said, this little X, token you would place alongside of the miniature that you just activated so they know that that miniature has gone. Just so you can keep track of everything. It just help, makes it keep tidy and cleaned up and also easier to track. On the hero's next phase, both has chose to run. So first it was Sandra because she has the initiative for this turn. So she ran and because she ran she created noise. Zombie Rick was right here and he wasn't engaged in combat anymore with Patrick. So he shambled six inches which will create directly there. So he's ready for melee. And on uh, for the second action Sandra chose to try to hold her nerve and she rolled a shield so it dropped the threat track down by one. And then Patrick, you can see here, he did a run too as well. He ran up and then that way. So that's where he ended. And then the zombie, this the Mohawk zombie was the only zo closest zombie that was in the 10-inch uh, range because every time you run, you make noise. So this zombie moved up to here. Another thing I like to note is because the closest zombie actually was Rick to Patrick and Patrick Graham, but Rick automatically went into uh, melee combat with Sandra because Sandra created noise. So once a zombie is in melee combat, the zombie will not move anymore until that melee is resolved on the melee phase. So there we go here, and that ends the uh, moving turn or the action phase for the heroes. And like I said, both of them tried to hold their nerve and both of them were successful in rolling the shield so the threat track went down. So we are in number three, all quiet for both. Now we are on to the event phase. I just moved the fence of the way so we can check for the kill zone during the event phase. And you can see Patrick is just outside the kill zone so we will not move. But you can see definitely in kill zone but is in melee already with Sandra zombie chain so that's going to be a melee and that ends the first part of the event phase for checking kill zones the next part of that is going to be to draw the event card i'm just moving that fence back because i moved it just so i can check the kill zone so let's try the event card and see what happens for this event phase we are in all quiet and low threat because we did uh, manage to hold our nerve and because of that it says won't stay down all quiet low threat for each prone walker, roll the black dice. On the shield, walkers get up. If there's no prone walkers, add one to the threat level. Uh, so you can see there, there's no prone walkers. So all we do is we are going to increase the threat level by one right there. And that ends the event phase. Now we're on to the melee phase. Woo -woo. And you can tell that they're in melee. They're not in melee, so the threat counter will go up one again, and then we're going to resolve Sandra's uh, melee. As you can probably tell playing the game now that this threat track will constantly fluctuate, going good and bad, good and bad, good and bad, because unless you forget to hold your nerve, in that case it's going to constantly keep rising, or if a scenario says you can't do any hold your nerve. Anyhow, we are on to Sandra's uh, melee phase with uh, zombie Rick. This time, Sandra's choosing to defend against the attacking walker, Rick. So, melee is one red, and Sandra's defense is one white. So, let's see what happens in this one. Oh no! So look what happens. What happens is that Sandra failed to defend against attacking walker rick and rick gets one so we're going to have to resolve this on sandra this is not a good thing first thing that happens with sandra is she's going to take one hit one wound now if by chance when rick the zombie rolled and got some marks and an exclamation mark that would be a bite and then what would happen is that this would flip over 
and she would have to do a test at the end of the turn to see if she is able to take a not take an extra wound from the bite but that did not happen so she just loses one wound and because of that Rick was successful or zombie Rick Walker Rick so Sandra is pushed back one inch because she lost and that's the end of the melee phase now the next part of the melee phase deal would just simply be the end phase and there's nothing really to clear here so we're going to keep going on pushing forward just a quick note about the melee that just happened between zombie walker rick and sandra now sandra lost she could push back one inch and she took a hit on top of that uh, what happens with Sandra is again, she's going to take a hit so she gets dropped in one and I did explain about if rolled an exclamation mark it takes a bite. Heroes will always win in a tie as I said before in the video. Now on top of that what I did not mention however is that with the zombies, zombies can never ever defend they can only attack. So when I said previously in the video that uh, one defense dice for the zombie, it actually is that the zombie is always attacking, even though that uh, if the other, the survivor is attacking too as well. Now, where Sandra chose to do a defend and she rolled her white dice, if she rolled more to that zombie, the zombie would just get pushed back one inch and not take any damage because in defense you can't damage a walker or even like a another miniature that is on the other team in defense you can only push them back and I forgot to mention about uh, Sandra's special rule the nimble at the start of the melee including she may roll a black dice and onto the the shield she gets to move out of base contact with and move at least one inch away I didn't do that because I wanted to show the combat but just to let everybody know that Sandra's special rule of being nimble that at the start of melee I could have just you know rolled the dice and see if she escaped from being fighting with Rick but I didn't do that and because of that she took a wound but just remember some characters or survivors have special abilities special rules that you got to keep up on anyhow that is it for the melee phase the threat track did go up one because uh, at least one of them were in melee and on top of that the end phase is just you know rolling for prone walkers none of the walkers are prone and I didn't achieve any of the objectives so we're back onto the heroes action phase for the next turn on the next turn it is Patrick first it's his initiative and uh, what he did is he was here and he just did a sneak up to the air now he has to be in base to base contact to be able to search and he is, and there's no other miniature that is base to base contact as in a walker or uh, opposing team miniature because we're playing cooperative here anyhow. But he gets a search, so that would be his second action. So what you do on the search thing is I'm just gonna swing the camera over here and I go to the supplies. So Patrick gets to pick up one of these. And that is bandages. Now with bandages, Discard this card as an action to restore one health point lost earlier in the game. That would have been so much better for if Sandra had it. But anyhow, tough luck for Sandra. That goes in his pack because he don't have to carry it in his hands for an item or his head or body. So it goes in his pack and he has that in case he takes some damage. Or if he goes, uh, if he moves in the next turn up to Sandra, he could use it as a trait, one of his actions as a trait to give it to Sandra to help her out. But we're not going to do that. The next thing you do is after you do the search though, is this search token gets taken and it gets placed right onto Patrick's card. Now, this brings me to another good point that I just looked in the book for this possible uh, outcome of a scenario. If Patrick during the game does get killed, for any reason by attacking a, uh, another walker, attacking him or what have you, Patrick will, if he gets a headshot by uh, enemy miniature, then Patrick will not come back as a zombie. But if he gets bitten and dies because of the bite, you're going to take another miniature, a zombie miniature, and lay in prone one inch away from where he was, as in if he was, you know, by a zombie or what have you. And then that he would turn into a walker. Now on top of that, 
all equipment that Patrick would have picked up, such as these bandages, he would drop. And the way you would drop it is, well, not really drop that, you would just take this and you would put it back where he died at. So this is the puncher token you get for the core game. You, this is the 3D token you get. But you, what you would do here is you would take this and you would flip it over so it would say search. Search, which means the objective is pick up the search tokens. So the Sandra would be able to pick up the other search, pick up the search token that Patrick had dropped, but she wouldn't be able to search the supply deck because it was already searched previously by Patrick. So she would at least be able to pick it up and then that would add to the objective for the game of getting all three search tokens. And that is pretty much it for where Patrick picked it up. He gets a bandage card, he's not dead, and he stayed right there and he did sneak so the Mohawk zombie is not going to chase after him because he didn't create any noise. So we're on to Sandra now. With Sandra, she can, you know, just sneak up and she'll do the same thing or she could try to run to get closer and if she runs she's going to create noise but you can see there's no zombies that will really activate and chase after her because you know that is definitely like more than 10 inches away and the game is not going to be as interesting if I do that but tactically that would make more sense to go for the long one first but Sandra's not going to do that no way whatsoever she's going to sneak be base to base combat because sneaking is four inches and she picks this up just like so and she's gonna do look in the supply deck to see if she finds anything good this character goes on Sandra and again I said that we're not using the equipment cards for this tutorial it did not say to use the equipment cards just the supply the supply cards and that's what we're sticking with but when you were doing a search or whatever, you could probably pick up equipment instead of supply, but because of the tutorial, we're trying to stick to the rules as close as possible. Let's see what Sandra gets for the supply, shall we? Ooh, a hockey stick, melee weapon. Add a red dice to the melee attack roll. And it don't say anything that like it's a, a two-handed weapon or what have you, so I'm gonna take this. Just gonna clean up air a bit, make some room. And put it in her hand because Sandra's a lefty. Yeah, I'm gonna say Sandra's a lefty. So she has a hockey stick, so when she's going to attack, she gets an extra dice to her melee roll, which means she'll have two red instead of one, which will increase her odds of beating down zombie walker Rick. That's right. Now that ends the uh, action phase. We're back onto the melee phase. Or not melee, the event phase. First thing is the kill zone, but we can tell, obviously, you know, like nobody is in the kill zone part. Then we're just going to grab an event card and move on. The event card is Roamers. All quiet and low threat. We're in low threat, you can see there. So it does say each player moves one eligible walker in a direction of their choice. That's it. There's no increase in the threat level or nothing. That's not a bad card to get at all. And that's what I'm doing. I'll be back. Like the book says, some events can, most events are bad, but some events can work to the benefit. It depends all on to the threat level of where you're at, and we are still in low threat because we're at threat number five. And you can see, so Sandra chose to move zombie Rick shambling six inches back here, and Patrick chose to move Mohawk zombie six inches back here. So it, it's kind of giving them a game at this point because there's really not much more that can happen but I can't really say that because in the supply deck and equipment deck there's sometimes there's events or incidents that will happen like a walker will appear or what have you that may happen I didn't look through this and I'm not going to because we're going to play the, the tutorial mission one to the end to see what happens that ends the uh, event phase and we're on to the melee nothing's in melee and the walker is prone so that would be the end phase. We're back onto the movement. And now it's going to be Sandra's initiative again. Now because there's no walkers in sight whatsoever, Sandra's probably gonna just try to run up to this last one. Let's just, I'll measure it and see what it is and I'll be back. Cause Sandra's is going to be able to run up to eight inches. You can see Sandra ran, but with her eight inches, she is shy from being in base contact with that token, the search token, so the game is still continuing regardless. She created noise from running, so the 
Closest zombie within 10 inches will be able to move, but you can see there's no zombies within 10 inches of this. That's it. So it's on to Patrick's turn, and I think Patrick's going to run just to make it interesting, so hopefully one of these zombies will run after him or shamble up to him. We'll see. I'm going to run Patrick, and I'll be back. Patrick ran his 8 inches, and now, because of that, he creates noise, and we see the closest zombie, obviously, it is Mohawk Zombie here. He's going to shamble up to 6 inches, and as you can see, that is more than enough to be in base contact with Patrick for the next fight for the melee. Oh boy, Patrick wants that Mohawk guy. He's just, you know, you remind me of this bully that was at my school when I was growing up. And I'm really angry. I really, really disliked that bully. So you look like him, you may be him. I can't tell because you're all zombified. In either case, I'm gonna hit you as hard as I can. I'm gonna try to kill you because you deserve it, boy. I hate bullies! I hate them! I hate them a lot! For the second action of Sandra, which I didn't get on camera, she tried to do a hold in order to drop it down. She was successful, so the threat track goes from 5 to 4, but it's still in the low threat quadrant. And Patrick decided, hey, I'm going to try to hold my nerve 2 as well, but he failed. So it stays where it is. We're on to the event phase. Now, as before the event phase, you know, there's no there's nobody around Zombie Shane and Zombie Rick. They're all alone, but definitely in melee combat. And I don't even have to put the kills on there. And we are into low to quiet. So now I got to draw an event card and see what happens there. The event card this I'm drawing obviously is plus one to the threat, so it goes back up to five. Get there, get there, get there. There you go. And it is at low threat still. Each player moves one Elder Walker towards the nearest survivor. Hmm, this may not be good for Patrick because, you know, that looks like that zombie Rick is eligible. He's within the 10 inches. We will double check. And if that's the case, he's going to shamble up six inches to get closer to Patrick. I'm going to do that and I'll be back. I measured and I moved accordingly and he was right on six inches. So Zombie Walker Rick shambles up and gets in base-to-base -base contact with poor Patrick. So Patrick has two walkers. You know, this just goes to show you that when you are stuck in a zombie apocalypse, to never, ever, ever let your emotions get the best of you. Because he wanted revenge on that Mohawk Walker because it reminded him of a bully that used to pick at him when he went to school. And look what happened because of that. Now he's got two walkers going to attack him in melee. This is not looking good for Patrick whatsoever. For the melee phase, the only ones in melee, again, is poor Patrick with the two zombies. So because of that, we have to use this the rule about with the zombies attacking in a, a group to a survivor. So because of that, Patrick will either defend or melee, and then the zombies are going to attack. So it wouldn't be just one red, it's actually going to be three red dice for this. That is not good. Looking at the walkers card and comparing with the walker at numbering chart too as well, that's located on page six of the quick start guide. In either case, it explains it very clearly. So there's two walkers, so it's three red dice for the attack. And on here it also tells you too as well, outnumbering. A single walker in a combat rolls a melee value is normal one. A second walker in the same combat rolls two. So two plus one is three. A third walker rolls three and so on up to a maximum of five red dice. But you can see here, five walkers is 15 dice. So if there was five walkers on somebody, I don't think they would ever survive because that would be just horrific unless they had some great armor onto them. So let's resolve Patrick's combat. Hopefully he's going to survive this. Because of the two walkers that are in combat with him, Patrick decides to do melee, or not melee, defense with two dice. So first let's do the zombies. They get three dice. They're attacking. Oh, that don't look good at all. So that is a total of five hits and two bites. Ouch. Patrick, you're in trouble here. Oh, come on, Patrick. You got it. You can beat this. I believe in you. No, he only gets two. So therefore, there's five, 
Take away two is three, and there's headshots, so bite mark. So what that means is Patrick is going to lose one, two, three, and he get, he's bitten, so he can get infected. Oh boy, Patrick, you're, this is not good for Patrick at all. He may die and become walkers, a walker. But he does have bandages. Discard this card as an action to restore one health point lost earlier in the game. So if Patrick survives the test to see if he's going to take another wound or not at the beginning of his turn, then he's going to be able to use that to try to heal himself, at least for one damage, but he still remains bitten. So, as I mentioned before earlier on in the video, that this can flip over to a bite mark, which I did do, because it was on to the life health sign, and then it went over to the bite mark for Patrick, and because of that, at the beginning of the next turn, Patrick's next turn, he has to roll the black dice, and if he gets a shield, nothing happens. He don't take an extra wound immediately. If he gets a blank, he gets another wound immediately, and this is before he can do any action. So Patrick, it's kind of teetering, you know, dying. And Patrick dies, that means the game is going to keep continuing on because Sandra, after she picks this up, she's going to have to make it over to where Patrick's dead body was and pick up that supply counter to end the game with three supply counters. This is starting to get very interesting and very intense because, oh boy, we don't know what's going to happen here. We just have to wait and find out. Because Patrick lost in melee, he is going to get pushed back one inch that is what happens to Patrick but the walkers are still staying one inch away which is definitely going to make them in this kill zone in their kill zone Patrick's going to be in that's not a good thing so Patrick is in a lot of trouble so far anyhow we're back on to the end phase now and the end phase there's no prone walkers no objectives are reached so because of that we move back on to the movement for the characters and it is Sanders turn and we'll just go from there. This is getting intense. On Sandra's turn, she's sneaking to here. And she's gonna pick it up. I was, I just paused there for a second because I'm thinking that she can make noise for her second action instead of picking up the search token to draw the walkers towards her and she may do that because it's going to take a little bit of heat off of her friend Patrick. I gotta think on this one. What are you laughing at? Did you play this game before? Did you play this game before? Do you know what that happens? You're right. I know. You are right. I just checked about making the noise and even if Sandra chose for a second action to make the noise it has to, any elves walker will move closer to the noise, but elves will meet within the 10 inch range, and you can tell Sandra is far from 10 inches away. So even if she wanted to try to help Patrick, she can't. <sighs> now, because I didn't do that previously, I chose for the first action for Sandra, she was gonna move because she's just excited to see that search token to get supplies. What she technically should have done is moved closer this way and then made noise because they would have been within 10 inches and it would have took a little bit of heat off of Patrick. But, so be it. Sandra's like, you know, Patrick, you're bit. You're going to change regardless. It's just a matter of time. I'm going to complete the objective. Sorry, Patrick. Sorry. So Sandra picks up for her second action the search token. It goes on here, so she's got two, which is really good. And she also gets a supply. She already got a hockey stick. Her next one is bandages. That's really good, because she could use these. She, she only has one damage, but she could use this to help her if she gets hit by any of the other walkers. Whew, really good. Now we're on to Patrick's turn. Patrick is in trouble. Because Patrick is bitten, He's infected, so he has to see if he shrugs off the infected bite mark and moves on to help. He needs to get a shield. If you don't get a shield, then Patrick is going to take another wound, which means he dies. Uh-oh! Uh-oh! What are you laughing at? What? 
You knew that was gonna happen? I don't think so. You're a zombie, you're not a psychic. Give it up. Patrick rolled a blank, unfortunately. So therefore, he succumbs to his injury, it accelerated, and Patrick has been bitten. So that means that poor Patrick is going to turn into a walker. I'm sorry, Patrick. I'm really sorry, but uh, he is gone. But he's really, he's dead, but undead at the same time because we lay down a walker in his place, which is right there. Now, surprising enough that when Patrick got bit by a zombie and you know, he, he died and turned into a walker, his skin turned green and he managed to be able to change his pants because he's wearing blue jeans now. Patrick was wearing like khakis and he changed the blue jeans. I guess he just wanted to you know, stand out a little bit more, make them, you know, I don't know. But that just means that, you know, Patrick is dead, but not dead. He's an undead, I guess you can say it. So he's dead, and you take the search to... I'm just going to use this instead of the 3D1, and I flip it over the search, which means that Sandra cannot pick it up and search, but she can just pick it up as one of the objectives. Once she picks up this one, if she's able to do it, then that just means that she wins. But she has to go through all of the zombies first. Arrgh! Poor Shane is so far behind, he's just chilling, relaxed, he's like, oh, I want some food, I want some brains! But there's no brains around. Because these guys are hogging it all, as you can tell. God! This is horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Anyhow, so that is the end of the uh, hero phase for both. Poor Sanders left alone to try to pick up that last search token. Now the next thing is gonna be the event phase. There's nobody within range. And then we go on and we draw the event card. Hopefully it's not gonna be bad for Sandra. Just a quick note about where Patrick was killed and replaced because of the bite mark with a, a walker. Any supplies or any equipment that Patrick has is pretty much, it's lost from the fight. It says in the book that, you know, during the fight and everything, they're trampled on, they're broken, or they're just beard and mud and you can't get to them. Now, what I checked to as well is just to see possibly if the threat track would go up if you lose one of your survivors. I can't find anything in the book about that, so I'm not going to raise the threat track, but... If by chance somebody knows the answer to this, that if a survivor dies, the threat track will go up by one. Please let me know in the comments down below and say, yes, it's on page so-and-so in this book or that book or an FAQ, that when they die, the threat track does go up. But right now, as it stands, I'm not gonna raise the threat track because I do not know that answer. And we're gonna keep continuing on. And we were at the melee. No melee, and we're at the end phase. So this is where we can see if Patrick Zombie Walker is not prone anymore. And the way you do it, you should take your black dice and you roll. If you get a shield, he stays down. If you roll a blank, he stands up. I think that's how it is. I'll double check, but his shield. So let's compare the results with the book and see what happened. I want to clarify a rules mistake that I made in the video back a little bit and that is whenever a survivor gets hit because of a zombie attack with the bite mark and if there's no exclamation mark or even if they are don't matter that survivor will be pushed back one inch and gone prone so here when uh, Patrick get hit for one but it wasn't a headshot and they could push back Patrick should have been prone and then on his turn as one of his actions, you have to use it to an action to stand up. But we didn't do that. That was a rules mistake. My bad, but it's too far back in the game to re-go over it. But just to let you know that if a survivor gets hit by a zombie or by another survivor game, then, you know, it takes damage, they're going to go prone. I forgot about that. Sorry, everyone. I'm still learning, like I said, first game, first game. On the end phase where we rolled a black die and got a shield to see if Patrick Zombie Walker would stand up. It says in the book is on a shield the zombie would stand upright. So forget what I said before because this zombie 
Zombie Patrick will change his pants when he became a zombie. And you know what happens when you die, you know, you lose all control of your bowels, you know, anyhow. So he stands up because we rolled a shield. And that is the end phase. We're back on to the movement phase, or the action phase for the heroes. Poor Sandra's left alone, and she's all the way over there. She has to make it to that search. Oh boy. She has to make it to that search thing and pick it up to finish the turn, to finish the game. But she has three zombies that are, you know, very close to that to contend with. And she also has zombie Shane who's just chilling over here. Oh boy. Sandra may run or she may just sneak. If she sneaks, the zombies are just going to stay there. So if she runs at least gonna create noise. The closest zombie, which would probably be the Mohawk zombie, will be the one to move up. I think that's what Sandra's gonna do is she's going to do a run, her eight inches, and then maybe this Mohawk zombie's in the what in range and he's gonna move up. We'll see. Sandra did her run action and she unfortunately as you can see was in the range to create noise the closest zombie which is the mohawk zombie that helped get rid of patrick living patrick anyhow is in base to base for melee so that is it for uh sandra she did a run there she can do another action and that is to hold her nerve if she wants because we are on threat level five but even if i hold her nerve successfully it's only going to get down to four so do you know what I'm not going to do that for a second action. I'm going to stay with exactly where I am. And that is it for the hero phase. Next is going to be the... The melee phase, or the event phase, I should say. Obviously, kill zone, no kill zone, no kill zone for that too as well. And no kill zone. Sorry, uh, Zombie Walker, Shane, I didn't forget you were there. It's okay. And because of that, then we're going to draw the event card. Event card it is. This is not looking good at all. Event card is roamers. We are still in all our low threat, so it's all quiet and low threat. Each player moves one eligible walker in the direction of their choice. Thank goodness instead of, you know, closer because that would be bad. In any case, that goes down there. Now... They can only move one walker in a direction of their choice. Now, either way, Sandra's gonna have to be in combat twice. Once for the Mohawk, and then once for either Patrick or Rick. Excuse me, I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm not getting the hiccups and trying to stop them on camera. Wah! In any case, I think what we're going to do is we are going to back up Rick. That's what we're going to do because, you know, Sandra and Patrick got in a little argument and Sandra's not very happy with Patrick, so she just wants revenge too, I think. So I'm going to move Rick. Rick has been pushed back his shambling distance, so a little bit of distance, a little less heat off of Sandra, but Sandra's still coping with the Mohawk zombie. But with Sandra, she has that special rule of being nimble. So what she's going to do is she is going to roll the die. If she gets a shield, she's one inch away from the, uh, the Mohawk zombie she's able to go. But before I do that, because the start of the melee phase, they're in melee, so the threat counter goes up to one. Goes up one. So now it's six. Sandra needs a shield to move. She don't. She fails. So she sticks in combat with this Mohawk zombie, and now there's melee going on between the two of them. I totally forgot that for the action, Sandra could heal her wound. Too late now. And she didn't even do a hold her nerve to see if she dropped it down that I could remember. I'm kind of just getting all bummed out here because Patrick died. I liked Patrick. <laughs> he died though, it's really sad. Anyhow, so Sandra's going to melee the zombie with the mohawk. So Sandra gets one red die, plus she has the hockey stick weapon, so she gets an extra red die. So that's two red dice against one for the zombie. So let's roll the zombie one first. Blank. Oh, that's a good one. Good sign. I need a headshot here. Give me a headshot. 
No! Sandra gets two hits though. So because Sandra hit the zombie twice, it gets pushed back one inch, and then it goes prone. That's, that's a little better for Sandra, I guess, because, you know, she needs to try to get some heat off her because the, the walkers are not very happy and they're always hungry. Yes, I know you're always hungry. I'd say you got a big belly or an empty belly, but you don't even got a belly anymore because you're just a head. <laughs> that ends the melee phase. Now we're on to the end phase, so there's only one prone walker. So we get this and roll it. Shield stands up. Ooh, blank. You stay down this turn, Mohawk Zombie, and I think you should because Sandra's getting very angry and she's just gonna kill you because zombies can't do really anything except defend when it's prone. When I say defend, it's rolling one dice. It can't really do any damage. So anyhow, that ends the end phase. Then we're back onto the hero phase. With Sandra is the only one left. Sandra has two actions. See, Sandra has one wound, and also the threat track is at six. She's just going for broke. That's all Sandra's doing. She's going for broke. Now, unfortunately, if she runs up there, she's going to create noise. And if she's in base-to-base -base contact with that search token, the closest zombie, which will be Patrick, will come up to try to attack her. See, this is the dilemma that Sandra is in. But, do you know what? I think that's what Sandra's going to do. Sandra's going to run instead of try to, you know, take revenge. Because the objective for this game is to pick up that last search token. That is the objective. Because Sandra don't want to let her anger get the best of her like Patrick did. You can see what happened. Patrick turned into a walker because his anger of the bully got clouded his judgment and got in the way of logic. So because of that, Sandra's not going to go after him and kill him. Sandra's going to run up to here and then, you know, her second action, I think what she's going to do is hold her nerve or heal. Uh, I think she's just going to heal because it, if the threat track goes up, it's still two away and she's not going to panic yet until it goes into medium because her threat, no, her nerve is medium. So that, that's what she's going to do. I just decided, or Sandra decided. Sandra's going to run up. Second action, she's going to heal. And that's what happens with that. And then we're going to be on to the event phase. You can see there, Sandra ran, so she creates noise. This zombie is the closest. So he engages her, so she, Patrick, the zombie walker, is in base-to-base -base melee contact with Sandra. Sorry, Rick, you're staying there, and Shane is still just illin' and chillin'. And the bully Mohawk zombie is just still down. So, for her second action, like I said, I'm discarding this bandage card. So this is going to be discarded there. Oh, wrong, I grabbed the wrong one. That should have been gotten in here because Patrick is dead. So this is her bandage thing. It's getting discarded. And she is going to heal her one wound, which is right there. And that is her actions. And we are on to the event phase. Now, I don't have to do the kill zone because obviously we know that that zombie is in melee contact. So now we're just going to grab the event card and see what hell is going to happen here. This is, they won't stay down, all quiet, no threat. For each prone walker, roll the black dice on the shield. The walker gets up. If there's no prone walkers, add one to the threat level. Excellent. So we have the prone walker, only one. So Mohawk, bully. Blank. No, he don't stand up. So... Oh, no, 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 no. I read this wrong. On the shield, the walker gets up, but the walker didn't get up. If there's no prone walkers, add one to the threat. But there was a prone walker. I thought it said and, but it's add if. If and add, the keyword. So therefore, this don't go up. He don't stand up because he rolled that. So Sandra is still kind of lucky. And now we are into the melee phase. Sandra is going to obviously melee. 
she's going to attack with the two red dice and the zombie's going to attack with one. We've seen this before, but before we do the start the melee, we forgot the threat level has to go up one because at least one miniature is in melee combat. So this is the zombies right here. One hit, Sandra. Get two and an exclamation mark to put that zombie down. Hmm, no, only one. But it is a tie, and because it is a tie, the tie was goes to survivors, so this zombie walker gets pushed back one inch, so it is off of the search. We're not touching. I'm gonna double check for the measurement because I don't want to ruin that. So there, oh, look at that. That is exactly one inch, so this is horrible because then Sandra can't pick that up because the zombie is in base to base with the search token. Oh! The, the horror! This is crazy! We're on to the end phase. We didn't reach our objective, which is pick up all three search tokens. We do have a prone walker, so we have to roll to see if that walker stands up. Badge stands up. And it is a badge. So the this bully mohawk walker stands up. That is not good for Sandra because, you know, she's getting attacked. She can get attacked there, there, and there. So she may potentially have three zombies at one point onto her. She needs to work fast and hard to get this done. So we're back onto the uh, Sandra's phase for the two actions. So the first thing Sandra's going to do now, she already healed. She's going to try to hold her nerve to see if you can drop the threat track down a little bit because it's getting close. You can see it's at seven now. So come on, Sandra, hold your nerve. Yes, she holds her nerve. So therefore, the threat track gets down by one. That's one action. Second action is she is just going to stand right there. Because it don't make a difference. You're probably asking like, why did she do that? Because she is coming base to base contact with the zombie. That zombie is definitely in the kill zone, or Sandra's in the zombie kill zone, the walker kill zone, so he would move in regardless. So Sandra's just taking the initiative for moving up and saying, that's it, I had enough of you, Patrick. You were a pain in my side when you were alive, and now since you're dead, you're a pain in my butt, so I'm gonna end you right now. Well, first we gotta do the event phase. Didn't have any kill zone stuff to check, so now, the next thing we have to do is we are going to have to grab the event card. Now, the soul one was on top. I think that got mixed in. It shouldn't have been there because that's for the uh, Woodbury, the Prelude to Woodbury solo game. So I just put it on and I just flipped it up here. So I'm going to grab this one. Pandemonium! We've seen this before. Threat track was up by one. So it's back at seven. All quiet, nothing. We're not all quiet, we're at low threat. Each player rolls a blue dice and moves that many many eligible walkers in a direction of their choice. Then a, then a white dice walkers enter play. So there's two things that are gonna happen here. Number one, we gotta roll a blue dice, die. And then that many eligible walkers gets moved in any direction that Sandra chooses. And then we have to roll a white die and that many is coming on the board. Oh boy. So let's do that. First is a blue one, so let's see Sandra get high ones and they can move, she can move eligible ones. And eligible ones are only ones that are not prone or not in melee, and I'd say, you know, the tennis range. Two, this is a good thing for Sandra, because now Sandra is going to move back Rick and gonna move back Mohawk Zombie. I'll do that and I'll be back. That pandemonium card was a godsend because you can see more distance. So don't feel the zombie, you know, coming at her. And even more distance because Rick is not coming at her. Because Rick was within the 10 inches and so was this. So that I'm assuming that is what it means by eligible walker, unless it's just any eligible walker that is standing up. But in any case, if I did that or played wrong, just comment down below and let me know about that one too as well. And poor Shane is just still, you know, he's chilling right here. It's like, hey, I want in, I want in, but nothing's happening. So now that is the first part of that. Now we have to roll a white die, die and that many zombie walkers come on the board. 
one zombie walker comes on the board. When a zombie walker comes on the board, you have the choice of putting it wherever you want on the board. Now, this could be a benefit if you're playing against another player, so you could put the zombie walker closer to the other player. But in this case, because Sanders the only one left, this bloody mess zombie is going to go right there. Because, you know, she'll never make it up there. Not one bit. That is good. So that ends the event phase. Now we're on to the melee phase. And you can see the melee that's going to go on here. The carnage, the havoc, everything is going. Cassandra wants to kill this. Because it is a thorn in her side. Or at least knock, her, knock Patrick Walker zombie down. So that Patrick hopefully will not stand up. So Sandra gets two red die, one for her melee base and then one for her hockey stick. And the zombie only gets one dice. The one die. And they're all of them are red. Let's see what happens. Zombies first. One success. Sandra, you gotta beat that. Oh my god, look at that blank! Oh Sandra, this is not a good thing for you. So Sandra is going to take her wound. Just like that, but she's not bit. She just takes a wound. And because she lost, she gets pushed back one inch, which we know was right here. <sighs> and that's the melee phase. Then we are on to the end phase, but there's nothing at all for the end phase. Nothing that happens. <laughs> I forgot one thing too as well. Uh, what it is is because at the start of the melee, they were in there, the threat track would have went up. So that threat track is at 8 now, so it's teetering on the medium. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That ends that turn. Now it's back on to Sandra's turn. And you know what Sandra's doing. Sandra is for her movement, is going to go here. Actually, before she moves, she's going to do a hold her nerve, and then she's going to move. So I'm just going to keep this rolling, and I'm going to whip. Hold your nerve, Sandra. Hold your nerve. She does. So, threat track goes down by one. And for her second one, she is moving up, whoops, base to base with this zombie. Because, you know, it's gonna happen regardless, it's inevitable. And that ends Sandra's turn, and now it is on to the event phase. And we already know that the only kill zone already, so we're gonna draw an event card. Event card is Two quiet, plus one to the threat. That goes up. I don't like this. All quiet, low threat, which it still is. The walkers suddenly stop and nothing seems to happen. Add one to the threat level. What? Oh, so that brings it to medium. This curd. Too quiet, but no good still. No, no. We're getting closer. We're almost close to the end of the game. This is kind of like just a battle back and forth between... Patrick Zombie Walker and Sandra. <sighs> so that ends the uh, event phase and we're on to the melee phase. Obviously, this is going up one. So it's at 10. We are eight away from dying. Now it is going to be Sandra. Is she going to defend or is she going to attack? And I'm going to say attack because if she defends, the zombie's not going to take any damage. She's going to get pushed back. And we don't want that. So let's do another melee attack between Sandra and Patrick Zombie Walker. First is a zombie. One hit. It's Sandra. And the two again. One for her base and one for the hockey stick that she got. And she's got one. So it's tied and it goes to the winner or the, you know what I mean. So it gets pushed back one inch. So now at least she's, he's clear for the melee phase, which is good. And then we're on to the, uh, la, 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 the end phase, but nothing is there you can see on the board for the end phase. Because of that, we move back on to Sandra's turn. And you know what this means? Because she is on that base and there's nothing contesting her this time because he's not in base-to-base -base contact. Luckily, the rule wasn't there within three inches. It is not. I checked before. Whew. So do you know what that means? Sandra 
picks this up, but you don't get to do a search because it's been already searched. In any case, let's swing over to here. Sandra gets the three, and that is the objective for the game. So, Sandra wins. Sandra finally wins the tutorial how to survive mission. Just another quick note, on the back of the rules manual, it says the rules, where it has a quick reference sheet, at the very bottom it says going solo. The single player always has initiative and any reference to either of the players or the opponent refers to the single player. Increase the threat level by one at the end of each turn. Any event cards referring to the direction of the player's choice, move Walker towards the nearest survivor instead. That is for going solo, but we technically didn't go solo because it did say that you can play a cooperative for this the first tutorial, learning to survive, or you can play like as in one against one, one v one. So I know I just played it for just one, but I had two survivors, so it was not a solo mission. And in that case, you know, that's it. We successfully went through the first tutorial. I hope you stayed with me for the entire game. What? Keep quiet, I'm doing the end of the video. Zip it, zip it, zip, ah, zip. Don't, don't. All right. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you stayed with me for this entire battle. It was very interesting. I did learn a lot of the rules. Hopefully I didn't fudge any of the uh, the rules. If I did, again, please comment down below. Refer to the page number and let me know how to rectify what I did wrong into this battle report. I really, really love zombies, as if you can't tell. Yes, I love you, I know. In any case, I do love zombies. This game, The Walking Dead TV series, I watched a lot of it. I didn't watch it all, unfortunately, not yet, but I did watch it. Comic book for The Walking Dead is incredible too as well. Check that out. Check out The Walking Dead TV series on AMC channel. Whew. I'm just like, this game took a lot longer than what I thought for the tutorial. Because it was, in the end, it was just a back and forth between Sandra and Patrick Zombie Walker. Like it was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So we did manage to succeed. We picked up the supplies. Some of the supplies, I should say, because Patrick picked up that one, but he did lose it after he turned into the Walker. And Sandra would go back, make her way back you now to the compound so that she can give the medical supplies and you know the food and water and everything to help sustain the colony a little bit longer. Who knows, maybe Sandra is going to encounter more walkers on our way back. I don't know, but for this tutorial mission, we succeeded by getting all three search tokens. Lots and lots of fun. Again, thank you very much, Mantic Games, for making this fabulous game. I really, really enjoyed doing this video battle report. I'm glad I finally got to play it, because since I got to play it, I'm going to play more missions. They're gonna be solo missions, and I'm gonna to try to get some more board game maniacs in so that we can play uh, one team against the other team and then the zombies thrown in the mix to attack. Lots of fun. If you wanna check more of this stuff out, like I said, you can go to your local game store. I'm sure they had The Walking Dead All at War by Mantic Games because almost every game store would have that. If not, you can always go to the website manticgames.com and you can look up The Walking Dead. You can purchase the core set there, expansions, uh, the 3D scenery, everything. You can get it all from them too as well. And on top of that, on top of that, I really, really hope that you're gonna comment down below and let me know what you thought of this battle report. I wanna show this to Mantic because I just wanna give praise to Mantic for such a great game. Great looking miniatures, great looking scenery, great rule set, very easy to play and to understand as far as I find, found any. I hope I didn't screw up on the rules though. But hey, I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too watching this. And again, just a reminder, if you want to catch more of this stuff, hit the like button, share this video, subscribe to our channel Board Game Maniacs on YouTube. Show us some love so that we can continue keeping 
playing these great battle reports such as The Walking Dead, All Out War, and many, many, many other gaming platforms and board games and tabletop games. So until next time, talk to people. Talk to people in person. Communication is key no matter what it is. Because if there was no communication, there was a zombie apocalypse, it's not going to be long before everybody's going to be a walker because nobody's talking to each other. There's going to be no plans. You're going to be shooting other human survivors when you should be talking and communicating and working with each other to survive and push on the human race. See, this is all tying in together. Every bit of it. Oh, yeah, that's right. But my final note, and you know exactly what it is. What? You're not saying my final tagline. Quiet. Quiet, zombie. I'm doing it. This guy right here. You're just a walker. Well, not a walker anymore because you don't got a body. Shh. Anyhow, till next time, be a maniac.